Ever wonder what it means to dress to the nines? Because that's what I'm doing now. Got my gray striped pants, spats, shoes polished like mirrors. And on the dressing stand is my wing collar, ascot, cufflinks, diamond pin, watch and chain, silver tipped walking stick, and my top hat. If you're going to dress to the nines in the dog world, this is the year, because 2021 heralds the return of the Morris and Essex Dog Show after a six-year hiatus. To those outside the dog world, the phrase Morris and Essex carries no scintillation. But for those in the world of dog sports, it's, uh, what's the phrase? Ah, yes. This is a big f***ing deal. Period clothing isn't required, though many opt for it as a tribute to its past glory. I'm Bud Bacone. In the next few minutes, I'll take you on a tour of a century and a half of dog shows, in particular, the 30-year heyday of Morris and Essex. You'll see how dog shows have been dramatically reinvented over the generations and how those reinventions speak volumes about the ever-evolving bond between humans and dogs. But before we do that, I got to get into this corset. Ready, team? Two, six, heave! Heave! Perfect. It's not the dog that needs training, but the owner. I am 50% pointer. There it is, there it is, there it is. The American Kennel Club. Lady <laughs> boy. Total two, no two, two. And of course, Lassie. Down and back. Stories from the AKC archives. <laughs> With Bud Bacone. In 1996, Wayne Ferguson was visiting St. Hubert's Animal Welfare Center in Madison, New Jersey, a rescue group on whose board he served. Knowing of his interest in purebred dogs, a staff member suggested he visit the attic above the kennels, telling him, there's an awful lot of dog show stuff up there. Up to the attic he went. Sure enough, the attic was filled with boxes of trophies, marked catalogs and judges' badges. There were finely etched names and gold embossed graphics beneath decades of dust and neglect. Ferguson knew right away. The memorabilia had belonged to Mrs. Geraldine Rockefeller Dodge. These were the remnants of an annual event with a capital E, a high point in the calendar, not just in the dog world, but in the highest society circles, the Morris and Essex Dog Show. Until 1927, the show was but a glint in the eye of Mrs. Dodge, one of the great dog lovers and dog breeders in the country. It was at her urging that purebred dog enthusiasts in the adjoining counties of Morris and Essex were merged. On May 28th that year, on the polo field of Geralda Farms, her country estate, the club's first dog show was staged, and oh, how it was staged. On picture-perfect grounds, with lawns, manicured, billiard tables smooth, were 15 rings, four colorful tents, and lavish box lunches, as 595 dogs were judged in 17 breed categories. Pipelines installed beneath the turf brought fresh water to where the dogs were benched. Mrs. Dodge, ever the gracious hostess, declined to show her own dogs in the competition. Best in show was awarded to champion Higgins Red Pat, an Irish setter with a string of wins through the late 1920s and described by judges as the dog that never seems to grow old. Press notices were sparse but glowing. Among them, this story from the Pittsburgh Daily Post dog reporter Charles G. Hopton, proving that inviting reporters to share in a most sumptuous luncheon didn't hurt any. The best ever may seem a somewhat hackneyed phrase when speaking of the recent annual show 
of the Morrison Essex Kennel Club, held at the polo field at Geralda, the beautiful estate of Mrs. M. Hartley Dodge, near Madison, New Jersey, Saturday, May 28th. When the very best entry ever seen at an outdoor show in America assembled. Imagine nearly 600 dogs competing at a show confined to 17 breeds, with the keenest of competition in every class, the largest and certainly finest rings ever arranged, and with every detail carried out to the Queen's taste. And a most sumptuous lunch to which everybody was invited gives one but a glimpse of this remarkably fine show, the best we have experienced on either side of the Atlantic during our 40 years in the dog world. On that May afternoon in 1927, the Morris and Essex legend was born, and it hadn't even begun to hit its stride. It was the beginning of a chapter in the story of dog shows that began just a few generations earlier. The first dog shows emerged in the 19th century as England's gentry discovered gun sports, and with it, a fascination with purebred hunting dogs. According to author Harriet Ritrow, those first shows took place in public houses, in rooms usually reserved for rat killing. Everyone present was an exhibitor, spectator, and judge examining one another's dogs. Then they sought to achieve some manner of noisy consensus. See also under A for anarchy. It's believed the first formal dog show was held in Newcastle on June 28, 1859. Sponsored by a gunmaker named Pape, there were 60 entries in either of two categories of gun dogs, pointers and setters. Prizes were, what else, guns from Mr. Pape's inventory. Dog shows grew in both size and popularity, expanding their scope to include non-sporting breeds. By the end of the century, one dog fancier reckoned that taking out Saturdays and Sundays, there is a dog show to be held somewhere or other every ordinary day of the year. In 1899, there were 380 dog shows, most in small towns or regions throughout England. And stateside? We've explained in the past how the American Kennel Club was formed in part to help bring much-needed uniformity to breed standards and dog shows. Unlike the sporting dog gatherings in those English pubs decades earlier, these were often society affairs. In 1899, one memorable show by the American Pet Dog Club took over New York's Metropolitan Opera House. The New York Times reported that some 4,000 visitors strolled through the show that first day, many of them the same people who attended the opera. Catching the reporter's eye was the doghouse installed there for Mrs. Winifred Harrison's Japanese Spaniels. It was described as... A miniature castle, lined throughout with Japanese flowered silk. Velvet carpet covers the floor, and thrown careless about are silken cushions for the fluffy, flat-nosed visitors from the land of the chrysanthemum. The dress and manner of handlers and spectators were as much on display as the dogs themselves. The American Field, a sporting magazine, remarked that the attire was so elaborate that when a lady left, the train of her dress did not leave for another 10 minutes. The show was rich in many respects, including prizes, some from the English dog clubs, chiefly the Ladies' Kennel Association under the patronage of the Princess of Wales. The Ladies' Kennel Association of Massachusetts offered a prize for the best dog owned and exhibited by a lady member of a show-giving club. And the owner of a French bulldog named Raquette was awarded a silver clock for winning a special category. Best Dog Owned by an Actress, an Irish terrier puppy named Masterpiece won the $250 prize set aside for Best Novice Dog That Had Never Before Won a Prize. Later in competition with 30 other dogs, Masterpiece would win Best in Show. In the early part of the new century, shows came and went, some lavish, many memorable, yet none would outshine Morrison Essex or its patron heralded as the First Lady of Dogdom. There was no questioning the pedigree of Geraldine Rockefeller Dodge. In her time, quite probably the wealthiest woman in America. Her father was William Rockefeller, president of Standard Oil. Her uncle John Rockefeller is considered by many to have been the richest American who ever lived. 
her husband, Marcellus Hartley Dodge, was owner and chair of the Remington Arms Company. In her girlhood, she received as a gift the first of her many dogs, a terrier named Brownie, soon followed by Bayard, a St. Bernard imported from the hospice of St. Gothard. She and her husband would live in adjacent his and her country mansions on a 2,000-acre estate near Madison, New Jersey. They named it Geralda. There, Mrs. Dodge indulged her love of dogs, building extensive state-of-the-art kennels housing up to 150 canines. The kennels included electric heat, a nursery, 200-foot fenced dog runs, and a tunnel through which every dog would take a turn visiting Mrs. Dodge in her residence. She raised some 80 breeds, producing more than 150 champions and 200 best-in-show winners, very often her beagles, bloodhounds, and cocker spaniels. On trips to Germany, she would return with German shepherd dogs, helping the breed get its foothold in North America. And for those exceptional dogs, life at the Geralda Kennel came with its own ride. The kennel's custom-made Cadillac would shuttle dogs to and from shows. It came with a 200-inch wheelbase and could accommodate up to eight dogs in removable crates. Her reputation grew, and in 1933, Geraldine Rockefeller Dodge became the first woman to officiate as sole judge for Best in Show at Westminster. We gave you a taste of Morris and Essex in its inaugural year now. Come with me and get to see it in its heyday. By the late 30s, a Morris and Essex dog show might draw 4,400 entrants competing in front of 50,000 spectators. Visitors were given gorgeous hardbound show catalogs. Club members, judges, and participants may or may not have shown wear and tear from the posh dinner dance in their honor the night before, which included lavish gifts for the arbiters. And those brightly colored tents? There were more of them here than at a Barnum and Bailey circus. Governors, celebrities, and the creme de la creme of dogdom attended. Got a German shepherd dog competing at the 1930 show? Well, don't look now, but the judge is Captain Max von Stefanitz, the father of the German shepherd dog and the man credited with developing the breed. In keeping with the stature and trappings of the Morris and Essex show were the magnificent dogs who rose in competition, such as 1935's Best in Show winner, champion Milson O'Boy, an Irish setter owned by Gertrude G. Cheever Porter, ranked among the greatest show dogs of all time. Among his accomplishments were 103 Best in Breed awards, and so great was his fame that a Pinkerton agent was hired to escort him to and from the ring at Westminster. In 1939, a Cocker Spaniel champion, my own Brucie, took best in show, emerging from the largest number of entries in Morris and Essex history. In his career, he'd win a total of eight best in show titles, two of them in back-to-back years at Westminster. The best in show winner of 1948 was champion Rock Ridge Night Rocket, owned by Mr. and Mrs. William Rockefeller just 15 months previous. No Bedlington Terrier had ever taken a group first, much less a best in show, which he won at Westminster in 1947. Added to that were his unprecedented back-to-back best in show titles at Morris and Essex in 1947 and 1948. The great show begat great dogs. So mighty was Morris and Essex that when a New Jersey state law prohibiting the ear cropping of dogs threatened to block hundreds of entrants from the show, the state legislature stepped in and amended the law. Such was the gravitas of the great show that everything is legal in New Jersey. The unuttered question on everyone's lips, how much did Mrs. Dodge spend on each of these incredible shows? Conventional wisdom suggests it was about $70,000, or more than a million dollars in today's money. For its first 15 years, despite the Great Depression, Morris and Essex got bigger and better, to the point where nothing could stop it. Except maybe... a world war. 
In late January 1942, just weeks after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the Morris and Essex Kennel Club show was canceled. In a press statement, Mrs. Dodge opined that such a display of canine class was not in keeping with emergency conditions. And it was just as well. So much of the nation's energy and resources were focused on the war effort. Many handlers were mobilizing to provide canine support to the military. This was no time for wing collars, string quartets, and bucolic extravagance, damn it. America had a war to win. Bill McCarty, writing in the Pittsburgh Sun-Telegraph, floated a theory that Morris and Essex would not return, adding emphatically that he hoped he was wrong. And so he was. Though things would be different. When the show returned in 1946, its spirit remained intact, but the world around it was different. Post-war America would never quite find the same appetite for such high society spectacle. An economic boom, the advent of suburbs, and a growing middle class would mark a shift in the country's personality. It would also mark a change in the dog's place in American homes. And with that, dogs would find growing appeal beyond society's upper strata. Where middle-class families used to regard canines as animals to be kept out in the doghouse, they were now welcomed inside as family members with a place by the hearth. Dogs had gravitated from shed to bed. Mrs. Dodge, who had poured energy and her own resources into the Morrison Essex show, may have read the writing on the wall. Though the show did well in post-war years, it would never recapture the sense of carefree excess it knew in the late 30s. In 1954, the show was canceled following disagreements about scheduling. In 1957, a six-year-old miniature poodle, champion Furcott La Ballerine of Maryland, won best in show in a 2,500-dog competition. With that, three decades of the Morris and Essex dog show came to an end. Show officials told reporters that neighboring factories had shallowed the labor pool and that the cost of maintaining the roads, buildings, and infrastructure to maintain the event, a year-round endeavor, had risen too much too fast. Morris and Essex could no longer stage the event to the standard that Mrs. Dodge had set. Still, Mrs. Dodge and her devotion to dogs remained newsworthy. By the early 60s, sometime after she had been declared mentally incompetent, a judge refused a request by her court-appointed guardians to cut the food budget to the 49 dogs remaining in her kennel. The choice cuts of meat they consumed cost about $50,000 a year. That's more than 400000 of today's dollars. Given the estate's wealth, his honor deemed that this wouldn't break the bank. A decade later, on August 13, 1973, Geraldine Rockefeller Dodge, the first lady of dogdom, died. She was 91. However much it grew and changed throughout those three glorious decades, the essence of the Morris and Essex show didn't change. But the world did, including the dog world. The cultural shift, the pervading sense of democratization of the 60s and the 70s, eroded class barriers and transformed dog shows. To illustrate, let's pop back for a moment to a place we visited last season. Christopher Guest's comedy gem, Best in Show, with its deliciously inappropriate dog show commentary by the late Fred Willard. Morris and Essex, it ain't. Well, if you put him in a race, who would come in first? Yeah, if you had a little jockey on him going. Uh, let me ask you this. If you're going to put him on a football team, which would be your wide receiver, which would be your tight end? Who can go the farthest, the fastest? Well, I, I don't know any dogs that play football. Ah, <laughs> I'm having some fun with you here. A wise soul once said, when something makes you laugh, search it for a hidden kernel of truth. In Best in Show, one kernel of truth was a tension that came with the convergence of old and new world dog fanciers. While the fictional Mayfair dog show had an air of dignity and the dogs were of unquestioned pedigree, the participants were, well, you and me, America's middle class, 
reflected back in a mirror, or more properly, a funhouse mirror. Damn, it's not in here. You left it at the hotel. You go back and you get her busy me. Go to the hotel and get busy me. Run, run. The democratization of dog sports became the fertile ground on which Christopher Guest shot his film. In the 21st century, dog fanciers weren't always people who used 11 pieces of cutlery at dinner. That first Morrison Essex dog show held nearly a century ago ushered in the platinum age of dog shows, which had shaped and evolved considerably since those smoke-filled meetings in the back rooms of British pubs. The extravagant splendor, the attention to detail, and above all, the celebration of the purpose-bred dog has inspired a new generation to revive the show. Today's Morris and Essex is both an excellent show and a fond throwback to the show's heyday, rekindling the passion for canines that Geraldine Rockefeller Dodge shared with thousands. Though conceived specifically for dog fanciers, it became one of the hottest tickets in high society. The fine period costumes worn by some of today's showgoers is both a gesture of warm nostalgia and a tip of the top hat to the great lady. Since those glory days, dog sports have grown and dog fanciers have changed with the love of dogs and dogs themselves as the constant. Down and Back, stories from the AKC archives. Visit akc.org to learn more about all things dog and find bonus materials for this episode. Follow the AKC on Instagram at American Kennel Club. On Twitter at AKC Dog Lovers. And let us know what you thought of the show. If you're new to the show, subscribe with your favorite podcast provider to catch up on season two and dig into all of season one. Founded in 1884, many dog years ago, the American Kennel Club is the recognized and trusted expert in breeds, health, and training. We advocate for responsible dog ownership and are dedicated to advancing dog sports. Research for Down and Back provided by the AKC Library and Archives, the only national repository dedicated to the sport and enjoyment of the purebred dog. Learn more about the collections at akc.org slash library. No humans were harmed while making this show. <laughs>